So the Rubin vase, the Rubin vase, is a famous optical illusion developed in around 1915 by the psychologist Edgar Rubin. The vase presents the viewer with a choice of two alternative mental interpretations. Either on the one hand, two white faces on a black background, or on the other hand, uh, a black vase on a white background. Now, a typical person sees one of the two mental interpretations and only discovers the other one after some time or prompting. After that, he only ever sees one of the two mental interpretations at a time, but never both at the same time. The one that he prefers to see is determined by his so-called perceptual set, which is in turn determined by such factors as context, past experience, and personal interests, personal preferences, and so on. For, now, perceptual set acts so as to uh, strengthen those signals, those mental interpretations that fit with it, and to weaken those that don't. For example, a Republican and a Democrat who listen to exactly the same political speech will hear completely different things, as indeed will a Tibetan monk, if he can at all be bothered to listen. <laughs> and if you were to ask them afterwards about what they had heard, you'd be quite forgiven for thinking that they had been listening not to one and the same speech, but to three entirely different speeches. Now, just as there are radically different ways of seeing or hearing the same thing, so there are radically different ways of thinking about the world, radically different worldviews. One of the central tenets of the Western worldview is that one should always be engaged in some kind of outward task. For this reason, the typical Westerner um, structures his time as a series of discrete programmed activities that he needs to submit to in order to tick off from an actual or virtual list. You need only observe the expression on his face as he plows through yet another family outing, cultural event, or grueling exercise routine to realize that his aim in life is not so much to live in the present moment as it is to work down his never-ending list. And if you were to stop him and to ask him how he's doing, he would most probably respond with um, a strained smile, a forced smile, and something along the lines of, um, fine, thank you, very busy, of course. Um, now, needless to say, he is not fine at all. <laughs> In fact, he is all the opposite of fine. He is exhausted, he's confused, and he's fundamentally unhappy, fundamentally unfulfilled. Now, in contrast, most people living in a country such as Kenya, in Africa, don't share in the Western worldview that it is somehow worthwhile or noble to spend all of one's time rushing around uh, from one task to the next. In fact, when Westerners go to Kenya and do as learned the habit of doing back home, they are met with peals of laughter and cries of Muzungu, which is the Swahili word for Westerner. Now, the literal translation of Muzungu is one who moves about, to go round and round, or to turn round in circles. Um, now, the 20th century uh, psychoanalyst, Melanie Klein, called it the manic defense. The manic defense, which is a tendency when confronted with uncomfortable thoughts or feelings, to distract the conscious mind either with a flurry of activity or with the opposite thoughts or feelings. A general example of the manic defense is, as we have seen, the person who rushes around from one task to the next, like the Muzungu. But other more specific examples include the socialite who attends one event after another, the small and dependent boy who charges around declaiming that he is Superman, and the sexually inadequate adolescent who laughs like a maniac, like a maniac, at the slightest intimation of sex. Um, now, it's very important to uh, differentiate this sort of manic laughter from the more mature laughter that arises 
from suddenly uh, revealing or emphasizing the absurd or ridiculous aspects of an anxiety-provoking person, event, or situation. Such mature laughter enables a, a person to see a problem in a more accurate and less threatening context, and thereby to diffuse the anxiety that it gives rise to. All that is required to make somebody laugh is to tell him the truth in the guise of a joke or tease. Drop the pretense, however, and the effect is entirely different. In short, laughter can be used both to reveal the truth, or as in the case of the manic defense, to conceal it and to block it out. Indeed, the essence of the manic defense is to prevent feelings of despair and hopelessness from entering into the conscious mind by occupying it with the opposite thoughts of euphoria, purposeful activity, and omnip omnipotent control. This is no doubt why uh, people in the West or people feel obliged or feel moved not only to mark but also to celebrate such saddening events as getting ever older, birthdays, New Year, entering the workforce, they call it graduation, <laughs> and, and even more recently, death and dying, Halloween, pretty spooky. Um, but you know, the manic defense also takes on more subtle forms such as creating a commotion over something trivial, spending every spare moment in study or reading or on the phone to a friend, spending months on end preparing for Christmas or, from, or for some civic or sporting event, seeking out status and celebrity so as to be a somebody rather than a nobody, entering into baseless friendships and relationships, and sometimes, sometimes even getting married and having children. <coughs> In Virginia Woolf's novel, Mrs. Dalloway, one of several ways in which Clarissa Dalloway prevents herself from thinking about her life is by organizing needless events and then preoccupying herself with their prerequisites, always giving parties to cover the silence. Ah, Mrs. Dalloway, always giving parties to cover the silence. Now, everyone uses the manic defense, but some people use it to such an extent that they ca cannot cope with even short periods of unstructured time, such as holidays or weekends or, or long distance travel, which no doubt explains why airport shops are so profitable. In short, it's not that the manically defended person is happy, far from it, in fact, but that he does not know how to be sad. And that's an important difference. It's not that he's happy, but that he does not know how to be sad. As Oscar Wilde put it uh, more than a hundred years ago, to do nothing at all is the most difficult thing in the world, the most difficult and the most intellectual. Now, sometimes a life situation can become so unfulfilling or untenable that the manic defense no longer suffices to block out negative feelings and the person has no real choice but to switch and to adopt the depressive position. In other words, a person adopts a depressive position when the gap between his current, his actual life situation and his ideal or dreamed life situation becomes so large that he can no longer carpet it over. His hopes seem far out of reach and he can no longer envisage a future. As in Psalm 41, Abyssus abyssum invocat. Hell brings forth hell. Or, in an alternative translation, the deep calls unto the deep. Thank you very much. <laughs>